Yeah. Okay, so now we're back up and running. So yeah, we were talking about Jarmila Katakilova and how through the use of hormones, she's able to change her body type to make it appear that she's, she's like a man. And, and so I'll, I'll show you guys at home, you know, hopefully the, the, the photos yeah. will show up. Let's see. Yeah, this is, this is, this is a famous woman sprinter from the 19, oh man, from the 1970s through the 1980s by the name of Jarmila Kotakilova. Look at her muscle mass. It is amazing what drugs can do in destroying the basic God-given, you know, genotype of the woman, so that the woman now appears manly. It's it's, it's astounding. Well, that's amazing that <laughs> that we see that sports even are being used, and and it's all part and parcel. I would submit to the satanic agenda, the transgenderism is a way of destroying the image of the man that God created and placed in the garden. And then you've got transhumanism, which is related to it, but slightly different, where you take human beings and make them something other than fully human, right. combine them together with machines to make the cyborg, and cyborg is just a, a, a contracted form of, of the phrase cybernetic organism that you know you six million dollar man remember that show from the 70s and lee majors man right remember that he, he got the air, air force pilot he gets into a crash and they, we can rebuild him we can make him better than he was before in other words better and faster you know and he's running and tracks you like this right and they, dun, 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 you got the little action figure. Yeah, you, yeah. Could, you could look you could look in the back of his head. Yeah, the guy. Look right the That was very cool. I have to admit, that, that, that was well done. But again, it was a subtle way of the Hollywood industry saying, $6 million, man, we can, make him, we can make him build him back again, make him better, stronger. In other words, the way God made him wasn't good enough. But through transhumanism. They can make little boys into girls. Well, well that, that, that's the transgenderism, but that, you know, that's not the transhumanism. Transhumanism is a whole different concept where you take a human being and make them something other than fully human. And that, you know, that God created uh, human beings. We've been through the, the concept of transhumanism. We're being indoctrinated in the same way that transgenderism, like if you're a boy, if you really want to be a girl, you can't, you can't be happy unless we're going to, but the transhumanism even more diabolical because it's saying that even the best of the best human beings isn't on the level of the future man, the evolved man, who is the God man. And you've got to use machines and we can interface. And now that's what they're working with. Ray Kurzweil, who's a physicist and a philosopher as well, who's saying that we were reaching the point that they refer to as, uh, what, what, what's the phrase Steve uh, Kurzweil uses? The singularity. Uh, the singularity where you can take the mind of the man and you can offload it into a machine so that supposedly your soul can be, you know, you, you put a USB port in the head, plug it in, you can download the soul into a machine and you can live forever. And you can put it in the body of a metallic man. You see in the latest version of the Avengers where they, the, the old Avengers character from the 70s, known as the Vision. I don't know if you guys remember read the Avengers comic books. That was one of my favorite characters in the Avengers. It was this guy who had a red face and a green body and a cape, and he was a an android, which was like a human who was part machine. And so they, they're, they're promoting that agenda that you know you, you can't be fully all you can be if you're if you're completely human. You need to transition from being merely human to being more than human, to becoming a god man. You will be, we'll do that through cybernetics, cyborg, cybernetic organisms, through transhumanism. And that's being promoted in sort of our musical genres when you see Beyonce, uh, how many of you have seen her in the music videos where she's dressed up in sort of a metallic outfit. Um, Metropolis, yeah. It is, exactly. Yeah. Steve, what is that? Metropolis. It's an old movie. A movie from the 1920s, when they first started yeah. film. Silent film, Jeremy. Yep. That's exactly right, Ben. It was a German film producer. Before, before they even had what they called talkies, yeah. made a movie about the future of the world 
And this, this, this woman, Maria, who was a robot in a woman's body, was the ultimate form of, of, of human life on the earth. And we see that sort of Fritz somebody. Lang. Fritz Lang. Ben, how do you know that, man? Yeah, you, you That's Fritz, Fritz Lang, Lang, man. That's right. <laughs> That's exactly. Fritz Lang's mm -hmm. Metropolis from like 1924. Mm -hmm. And we see that, that same agenda being promoted again and again and again. So now we understand what the entertainment industry is about isn't generating income for Walter Yetnikoff at CBS Records or for Steven Spielberg, you know, uh, making a movie for Paramount or for Columbia Pictures. It isn't about generating income for the music industry or generating income for the motion picture studios. It's about changing the paradigm, the worldview of the masses from that which God created in Genesis chapter one and two, man in the image of God, a woman created out of his rib as a help meet to him, to now the woman is exalted to the chief position and Satan came up with that battle of the sexes back in Genesis chapter three to basically disenfranchise God's super soldier, which is the man. And so it's a subtle and seductive attempt to use pride in the ego. It's, it would be very hard for a woman to be told, hey, you're getting shortchanged by this God of the Bible. He's a, you know, sort of, what's the word? He's a paternalistic, sort of, uh, you know, patriarchal sexes. Whereas I'm the God of this world. I love women. I want women at the forefront of what I'm doing. And so what do we see? We see if, if you look at, and, and I was talking to Steve about this new book written by Tom Horn, who was, you know, once upon a time, a pretty solid Bible prophecy scholar who has now jumped the shark, as it were. You know, he's right along with Fonzie on the, on the uh, ski do going over, you know, Jaws or whatever. And when well, the happy days goes to Hawaii or whatever, this is where the phrase jump the shark came from. The point at which it's so crazy that you can no longer believe it. It's no longer crap. And so we see that happening, and it makes it very difficult, you know, for a woman to, to, to not be tempted by that. And so when you get a, you know, well-known writer like Tom Horn, in his latest book I just read, he said that God had revealed to him you know, he called him up and it turns out he went to heaven just like Benny Hinn. God called me to heaven and showed me a vision and I was dead and I didn't get brain damage. And then God revealed certain things to me that I couldn't remember for 20 years. And now God has, has opened my mind. I now remember what God told me 20 years ago when I went to heaven. And he said that there's a third awakening. You know, the second awakening was the Pentecostal revival of the late 1800s the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles. You guys ever heard about that? Which was really supernatural, demonic supernaturalism infecting the church. I promise we'll get to Luke chapter seven. Um, but, but what we have is him predicting that God told him that there was gonna be a third awakening. And the third awakening would be this. The church will be now led by a coterie of females in the leadership position. He says, not just, you know, uh, assisting in, in the administration, but in the pulpit as pastors. And I was like, but is, are you serious? Did you, did you not read any of the letters of Paul? Like, is a husband of one wife? How, where does a woman fit in that? And, and then, then he says, thankfully, the individuals who had suggested throughout history of the church that women were disqualified from pastoral uh, leadership positions such as a preacher or the pastor of a church or whatever. He said, thankfully, those insignificant individuals are so minuscule as to be insignificant now in, in the new church that's being revealed by the Lord during this third great awakening. And he says, you know, the revival of Pentecostal charismatic signs and wonders will also be featured. So he says, women like, and he, he actually mentions uh, Joyce Myers, Women like Joyce Myers and uh, uh, Catherine Kuhlman. Oh, you know, and, and you know, Catherine Kuhlman has passed her mantle of leadership on to today's women like Joyce Myers and Beth Moore. And this will be the new, last uh, iteration of the church before the kingdom of heaven is established. I could barely believe it is actually coming out and saying this. And the thing that registered my mind was like, wait, isn't this exactly? 
What 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, that it will be through signs and wonders that the Antichrist will deceive people into believing that he is Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what Tom Horn is promoting in his new book. And it's not just his opinion. He's saying that he has had a supernatural revelation through a spirit entity who transported him out of his body. I think he's had an actual interaction with, with Satan in disguise. And so we see that even in the mainstream evangelical church, people that believe in the rapture just like we do, people who talk about the Nephilim just like we do, are promoting this new third wave of Christianity, this new awakening where women have replaced the men in leadership positions and they use signs and wonders and magic powers to persuade everyone that this must be of God, which is exactly what Jesus warned of in Matthew chapter 24, which is exactly what Paul uh, emphasized, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and John, so you've got the trinity of Jesus, John, and, and Paul. That sounds like a 1960s folk group, right? <laughs> Jesus, John, and Paul. And then once upon a time, the girl tried to take over the church, and they're playing on the acoustic guitar. Um, and so then we have John following it up with what? The book of Revelation, specifically chapter 17, 17 and 18. Specifically 17, Mystery Babylon. Mm -hmm. Remember, we talked about 18 talks about the Mystery Babylon in the form of a world government, right. but Revelation 17 talks right. about right. Mystery Babylon in right. the form of a harlot form of Christianity headed by a woman outfitted in scarlet and purple, a woman riding on the beast which is a symbol, I think, or a metaphor of the ancient Samirimus goddess worship system that really began not just in ancient Babylon, but I would say go so far back, even as far back to what, Steve? Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. That's where Mystery Babylon started, where goddess worship started, where women being worshipped as a deity started to, what, pervert the image of God. Man is going to be the leader, the image of God. No, no, I'm going to take the woman and make her my image, as opposed to the man, which is God's champion, and we're going to battle it out yeah. on the earth. God is using the man, like Fraser versus Ali or something like that. And so Satan has picked his champion, which is the woman, and we see that playing itself out with Nimrod and Samirimus in ancient Babylon. But then it plays itself out again and again and again. New iterations of the same old lie. Women on top, men subservient. Take a look at most of your romantic comedies and the things you see coming out of Men are always pathetic buffoons. Mm -hmm. You make fun of them. Or they're slackers. They're either strung out on drugs, smoking weed, or they're fat and incompetent and losers. Or they're just, you know, they're just pathetic. The women are always the champions and the smartest and the brightest. And, they're, and, and unless you think, like, oh my goodness, he's... he's, he's He's on a tirade against women. What I'm trying to do is alert all of you guys that are out there as to what's coming. Because it is an effect of important English. Like, oh my gosh, you know, they're going to, you know, uh, you know, what's it? What's it? What and quartered? Uh, what Drawn and quartered. Drawn and quartered. Man. I mean, tear and deployment. Yeah, it, it's important. But, but if this is what Satan is doing, and this is what the church is now promoting as this new third wave of Christianity, signs and wonders and women in leadership positions in the pulpit when a man who claims to be a pastor, a man who claims to be a prophet of God now because God took him directly to heaven and told him these things face to face. Then I have to look at the Bible and say, Paul got it wrong. First and second Timothy is wrong. Uh, Titus is wrong. Genesis is wrong. Genesis is yeah. wrong. All of the things, specifically though, the epistles right. of Paul, where he says specifically, pastors can only be men, and they can only be the husband of one wife. You know, you can't be drunkards, you can't have multiple affairs. All of that is wrong. Genesis, you can argue, well, you know, that's a question of interpretation, da, da, da. but you can't argue that the letters of Paul regarding who can be a pastor, a bishop, an elder in the church. You can't say that's just a, a question of interpretation of the ancient writ of the Old Testament, it is specific and clear. So if Tom Horn was told something different by God himself, then the Bible is wrong. We're all lost. Now what's more likely? That the God of the Bible got the Bible wrong and didn't realize it over the course of all these centuries? Or that this man, Tom Horn, who claims to be a prophet of the Lord and the Bible prophecy teacher, 
who has made a tremendous amount of money off of the books he's written about Bible prophecy. Either he's been deceived by a demonic entity disguising himself as God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Bible is wrong. Which of those two are you willing to stake, not just your life, but your soul on? I say, Tom Horn is wrong, he's been deceived by a satanic counterfeit. I'm not willing to say that the Bible is wrong, and that's why in Scripture it says God places the Word of God, the Bible, above even his name. And I was like, when I read that, that's blasphemy. What do you mean? The Bible is above even your name. You're the, the, isn't that blasphemy? He's, no, he's saying, listen, this is so sacrosanct. Yeah. This is so important that if, you know, I don't give you uh, a, a strong assurance and understanding that the word of God is reliable, then when, when the time of deception comes, you're going to think like, well, every time, I, you know, God has something important to say, he's going to pick a prophet, take him up to heaven, and something new is going to come up. But what God is saying is, no, no, everything that's necessary for salvation and conduct of life on the earth until Jesus comes back and rules over the earth himself is already written for you mm -hmm. in the word of God, the Bible. And if there's a question about doctrine, where do you go? You go to the, the Missouri Lutheran Senate in, uh, you know, Coraline, Idaho, or in, in, in you know, What's the, what's the capital of Missouri? Kansas City, Missouri. Jefferson City. Jefferson City, and then Kansas City is one of the other major cities. Do you go there and meet with the elders there? No. What you do is you go to your Bible, you open it up and read what the Bible says. And if what some man says is different than what's in the Bible, you go with what the Bible says and you disregard what the man said. Why? Because God, God said that's how it works. And so, goodness forbid, man, you know, my, my little segue there has gone on for, you know, 45 minutes now, but it's just, I just felt overwhelmingly pressed that the Lord wants this information communicated to you guys who are the real church. The real church is not the masses meeting in the large sanctu sanctuaries uh, throughout the United States and the world. We talked, I think last week, I was mentioning how Calvary Chapel on the Beach is having a, a woman's only conference right there on Miami Beach and uh, they're going to have one of the big famous female speakers. Uh, who was it that I said? It was, uh, the wife of Wes Bentley who was like some uh, missionary to Africa or whatever. And became a missionary because his wife divorced him and then he, I guess he, he met some female missionary over in Africa and he married her. Now she's leading a woman's missionary group. So Calvary's having this whole big thing on missionary stuff but it's limited only to women. What sense does that make in a church where men are the leaders in, in the church of God, but they're excluded from the meeting hall because now there's a special ministry called missionary evangelism, which men are excluded from. Oh, and it's also $75 a head. Did, I, did Phil mention that? $75 a head just to go sit in, in, in one of the chairs of the Calvary. And I just, there's something about that that sets wrong with me. It makes me feel like we are in the days of apostasy, boys and girls. And I guess that's encouraging to the extent that Paul says, this is what you need to look for just before the rapture comes, that there's going to be apostasy, not in Zoroastrianism, that the Zoroastrians are going to fall away from the mainline Zoroastrianism of the 1800s BC. But no, there's going to be apostasy in the church. And that people claiming to be born again Christian followers of Jesus are going to fall away from the doctrine once delivered to the saints. Doctrine is key. Doctrine is why we believe what we believe. Why is it key? Because it protects us from deception. And I, I know I meant to get the Luke chapter 7. This is one of the rare occasions where you feel like this is what the Lord wants to preempt my message with right now. So let's just, since we're on the topic of the apostasy, let's with, you know, because we, we, we don't, Probably have enough time to jump all the way through Luke chapter seven. But let's, if you would, Steve, yep. your heart. He already knows. He's like, <laughs> why don't I just flip over to Second Thessalonians chapter two and read it? Just go ahead and read that for us. And uh, let's see, Steve, you go ahead and read. It. Right. I mean, we'll split it up. You you get uh, how many verses do we have in Second Thessalonians chapter two? It's so foundational and key yeah, yeah. to the last days. How many? 17. 70 verse. Okay, so Steve, why don't you read uh, verses 1 through 6, through 1 through 5, 
And then Ingrid, you go ahead and read six through sixteen. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Well, we'll, 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 we'll do a verse. With Ingrid, no, since no, you're no. the lead up there, do one through six for us, Ingrid. One through five for us, Ingrid. And then Steve, you go through six through sixteen, eighteen. Okay. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Okay, so let me, um, let me go back and say, you know, it says, finally, brethren, pray for us that, you know, uh, let's see, where am I at, where am I at? Rapture. You know Two what, events. yeah. But... Second coming in the rapture. Okay, so it says, let no one see by any means, for that day will not come unless, the falling away comes first. What did we say that the falling away? It has a twofold meaning. What, what do we understand that to mean? Verse 3. Read that again for 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Mm -hmm. Let no man deceive you by any means that that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, so that... That that day mm -hmm. is the day of Christ, the day mm -hmm. that, that, that the Antichrist mm -hmm. is revealed and Jesus comes yeah, back to destroy him. But that day, the Antichrist being revealed on the earth can't come unless the falling away comes first. And we know that the falling away is, is from the Greek root. What, what's the Greek root, root word there? Apostasia, 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 which is what we get our English word apostasy mm -hmm. from. And it has a twofold meaning. It has a literal meaning that what, Steve? What's one part? Well, uh, yeah. What's... Physical departure Thank and spiritual. You. There you go. That's right. It does mean to depart, but in what sense does it mean depart? There are two different senses in which you can depart from Miami by catching a plane to New York, right? That's a departure. Departing now from gate six is the flight to New York City, all aboard, you know, whatever. That's a departure. But then when I say, you know what, I no longer believe that God intended people to be born again. I, I'm a Zoroastrian now. I reject the Bible. I have now departed from the faith once delivered to me by my parents or by the pastors that, that taught me when I was in Sunday school. I departed from that, and I now believe Darwinian evolution. A lot of people that go off to college depart from their Christian roots and adopt secular humanism and Darwinian evolution. So that means that apostasia, which means departure, can be a physical departure from one physical place to another physical place, but it also can mean a departure from one belief system to another. And I think in this case it means both. What this verse is telling us, I think, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, is that the Antichrist, his revelation here on the earth will be preceded by two events. One, the departure of people claiming to be born-again Christians from biblical doctrine that we find written in the pages of the Bible, specifically in the epistles of Paul, in the Gospels, in the book of Revelation, to a new belief system promoted by people like Tom Horn, Beth Moore, uh, and, and, and the like, who use signs and wonders to convince people that God is giving me a new thing. Yeah, I know the Bible says something completely different, but we're going to depart from that to this new paradigm, this third awakening, this new way of looking at the kingdom of heaven and his establishing it here on the earth. So before the physical departure, which is referred to as what? The rapture. The rapture. The rapture. We learned about that in John chapter 14. Before the physical departure of the church, I think the church is going to witness the doctrinal spiritual, as Ingrid said, the departure from the written word, the doctrine that Paul once delivered to the saints. And it was delivered only once, right? Once delivered to the saints doesn't mean means that every time some new religious guy comes up, we get a new doctrine, we get a new faith that we have to rely on. No, Paul says this is once for all time. So we are now seeing that people standing in the pulpit claiming to be the ministers of God's word are telling us, ignore what Paul wrote in Titus, first and second Timothy, about women pastors. Ignore all of that. God told me directly. When? Well, I died 20 years ago, and I went to heaven. Why didn't you tell us this 20 years ago? 
Oh, I couldn't remember. Got to the block. He said, like Daniel. He, he, you know, when I said, what's the meaning of all this? And, you know, he kind of said, go your way. And now, like John, I'm both Daniel and John, he, he's saying in his new book. And God has revealed to him. Now, remember what I told you in heaven you forgot? Well, now I'm going to make you remember. Now go tell the people, oh, yeah, the new last third wave of church manifestation of God's miracle and will on earth is women in leadership and men taking a subservient role. And so that is different than the doctrine once delivered to the saints by Paul. And scripture says it's only delivered once. So this must mean Tom Horn and all these other people, the Beth Moores, the Joyce Myers, the, you know, any... Uh, evangelical so-called Christian organization that promotes or accepts the doctrine is wrong. And we know that because we already had in writing what the real doctrine is. So, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, that no man deceive you by any means, that that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And then the man of sin, the son of perdition, is revealed. And then Ingrid, go ahead and, and, and read, uh, let's see, verses 4 through 8. Who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things? And now ye know that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who will now let it, will let, until he be taken out of the way. Okay, now stop right there. Now what, in, in, in the King James end, what does that mean, Steve? Restrain. Okay, he who letteth, will continue to let until he's taken out of the way. And and we, we find out that the let means allow now, back in, in, in King James in English, when this was written in the 1600s, it was really written back in 60 AD, but when it was translated into English in the 1600s, in the King James Version of the Bible, the, the word let in English meant restrain. So what this is saying is that he who restrains will continue to restrain until he is taken out of the way. Now, there's a number of interpretations as to who the he is, but I think the one that makes the most sense is what, Steve? The Holy Spirit. Yep, the Holy Spirit working by and through the church is restraining the revelation of the son of perdition. And son of perdition is another metaphorical term for who? Antichrist. The Antichrist. So he who restrains the Holy Spirit in the church will continue to train until he's taken out of the way. When is the Holy Spirit taken out of the way? He's everywhere. He's God. Rapture. At the rapture. Mm -hmm. When the church is removed, that special inworking of the Holy Spirit in our avatar, our physical bodies. Remember mm -hmm. I told you back in the day, I told you at the beginning of our talk here today, Satan wants physical bodies, not money. He already has all the money in the world. He's not aiming for, with his transhumanism agenda and transgenderism agenda, he's attempting to destroy the image of God, the man, through transgenderism and the promotion of the gay agenda. And he's attempting to create for himself a warrior soldier by the use of transhumanism, taking the human genome and extrapolating from that modifying it, augmenting it into something more powerful than man. That's what we have in Genesis chapter 6 in the Nephilim, Superman, who we now idolize in the Avengers and the X-Men. You know, one week the Avengers comes out of yeah. Hollywood and then Paramount and another studio releases the X-Men the next week so that we can glorify and basically deify these supermen, these godmen, these men who have arms and legs like but have superpowers. They can fly through the air, they can turn buildings upside down. They're like men who are gods. And in the X-Men's movie that just came out last week, they're battling against who's, who's the entity that... I, I guess it's, it's supposed to be gods who represent that. So apparently so. He calls, yeah. calls himself Apocalypse. Is that what yeah. The Apocalypse is the entity god that they're fighting that he's more than just a man. He's a god. And so all of this is really the book of Revelation being played out on theater screens throughout the nation and the world so that we can be desensitized to it when we actually see these things in real life we're going to say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm already, I've already been conditioned to accept it. That's called the what? Externalization of the hierarchy. The externalization of the hierarchy. Yes, that's exactly right. Wow. Are you guys the brightest guys in town or what? Nobody 
is getting over on our little house group. The <laughs> South Beach Gospel Home Fellowship is as on top of it, I would submit, as any ch house church anywhere in the United States. I would defy any little house church to compete against ours for our knowledge of the truth of the Word of God. Size doesn't always matter. It's not always the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight and the dog that counts. How about that? Huh? So, so here we are. So that's exactly right. The externalization of the hierarchy. So those of you that are out in the internet land, Google that. Externalization of the hierarchy, and you'll see that there was an occultic writer who happened to be, goodness forbid, a female, who wrote about that very concept and, and it suggested that that's the way you condition the minds of the people. And I would submit to you this, in defense of my position, which is a radical and controversial one, that women are the secret weapon, the primary tool for Satan to destroy the church. What? How dare you say this? That's, that's sexist. So be it. That is exactly what my hypothesis is. And I would submit to you, look at each one of the pseudo-Christian cults and the power and the devastation that they have wreaked in particularly American Christianity. And you'll find that behind almost every one of them, the life of woman. Seventh-day Adventism, goodness forbid, did I, ready? oops, did yeah. I, did, who founded that group? Everybody ready? Uh, no, Paul close. White. Close. Ellen, Ellen G. White, Ellen White. Yeah. the prophet, yeah. whose words were even more persuasive and controlling than the word of God itself. Ellen G. White, the prophet of Seventh-day Adventism. Seventh-day Adventists try to separate themselves. Oh, I, one of my buddies at the state attorney's office, we used to share, off, well, my office was the next day. He said, no, Herb, we're just like you. I go, no, my friend, <laughs> you, you're nothing like me. I'm an evangelical Christian. I go out and preach the gospel of Jesus. I believe in hell. I believe in Jesus, God, in the flesh. And if you're not born again by faith alone, you will spend eternity in hell. You guys don't believe in hell because you're Seventh-day Adventists. You guys are like my other friend, Erica, who's a Jehovah's Witness. She, like you, claims to be a Christian. She, like you, doesn't believe in hell, doesn't believe God will send people to hell. And so as a result, you guys have cut out the heart of the gospel, that Jesus is the Savior who has saved us from condemnation in the fiery depths of eternal damnation in hell. If you don't believe that, you don't believe the gospel. And so you've got Ellen G. White finding, founding the Seventh-day Adventists. But then who was the other name of Mary Baker? Mary Baker Christian Science. Christian Science, uh -huh. huh? How about that? Christian Science, founded by Mary Baker Eddy. So you have yet two, two powerful, I mean, these are huge, powerful, influential pseudo-Christian groups. And both of them were founded by women in the, in the 1800s and, and, and have kept, carried sway from that day until this day. And there have been men as well, you know, men who, you know, are responsible for the Jehovah's Witnesses, Charles Hayes Russell, and, uh, you know, he was a contemporary of Ellen G. White, and they both were followers of William Miller, and they came out of that apostate pseudo-Christian, the uh, Christadelphians, they called themselves at one point, they came out and created this new no-hell Christianity, you know, one headed up by uh, Ellen G. White, and then the other headed up by Charles Hayes Russell. And they gave some Seventh-day Adventists who try their very best to give you the impression. We're not like the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. No, no, those are pseudo-Christian cultists. But we're like you. We're mainline Christians. No, 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 my friend. The Adventists are no more mainline Christians than the Jehovah's Witnesses are. Let's just call it spade a spade. You got to call it because you don't believe in hell. You don't believe the gospel. If you don't believe the gospel, you will die in your sins. And so, again, what I believe we are seeing Right now, which is why I think the Holy Spirit has preempted my Luke chapter 7 message for today, is because a sense of urgency is missing in the commercial corporate church that dominates our land. But in the small house churches like this, the Holy Spirit can impact the leader even as he's driving. I spent all day like preparing my little notes and I got, I got stuff written in blue and I got like other stuff written in red and I got all my little transitions to the Old Testament. Of, oh, Tie this one right in. We're not going to use any of them. Because the message the Holy Spirit wants you guys to hear tonight is this. That sound the alarm. You know, watchmen on the wall. Because we are in the last of the last days. And we are seeing Satan manifesting 
the second Thessalonians chapter 2 apostasy in the church, not in Satanism, not in Wicca, not in Zoroastrianism, but in the church we see satanic counterfeits dressed bright and beautiful, appearing in the form of a lovely woman. Who could be offended or put off or frightened or threatened by some lovely girl who speaks to you in the name of Jesus? And what this guy Tom Horn says is that, oh, well, you know, women are better than men at, at promoting what he called the, uh, the, what do you say, the soft gospel or the gentle, the gentle gospel? In other words, women can stand up and say, well, Jesus just loves you as you are, and they can mother you. And he, and he used that. He said, see, men can't do that. Men can't, can't give the gentle gospel. Men are always talking about shell fire and damnation and repent and hell. But women can say, oh, Jesus loves you just as you are. Come to Jesus and be loved. You want happiness? You want peace? In other words, he's saying that women can make a false gospel more palatable than a hardcore guy like Ben. You know, he's not going to be as alluring with his gentle gospel. The gentle gospel is different than the gospel once delivered to the saints. And this guy Tom Horn is saying that women are going to be the new mouthpiece for this new gospel that's based upon compassion, mercy, and love. It has no hell and judgment in it. That, my friends, is not the gospel in the Bible. It's a different one. And if it's different, then it's false. And if it's false, then it cannot do what? Save. It can't save. And if you're not saved, what happens at the end of your life, Bill? You're going to hell. But, but for how long? Forever. Forever? Now that's, come on, now you're being a little, uh, you know, wow, that's a little harsh. That's not loving. You send me to hell forever? How is that loving? That's justice, my friend. There are two sides to God. He is both loving, but he is also just. And if he doesn't judge sin, and judge it not just for a little while, but forever, then he's not just. Even if he's loving, he's not just. For him to be God and righteous, which the Bible says he is, he has to be both loving and just. So sin must be judged not just for a long time, but forever. It must be eliminated from the kingdom of heaven, not just for a long time, but it's got to be eliminated forever. Now, those of you who have been suffering under the burden of being a Christian, which it is sometimes, it's a pain in the butt to be a follower of Christ. Yeah, is it? Ain't it? A little bit. Sometimes it is. But for those of you that have paid the price and have put in the work, when you finally get caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the clouds, and you know you're part of the kingdom, you got your new robe on, aren't you going to want? Aren't you going to take solace and comfort in the fact that you know that Man, I don't have to worry about Satan showing up again. Not a hundred years from now, not a thousand years from now. I don't have to worry about sin creeping in and perverting paradise again, which is exactly what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Once upon a time, on the earth there was a paradise. Once upon a time here on the planet earth was paradise. But then sin crept in, and with it, death and destruction. And for 6,000 years, human beings have been engaging in the process of dying, death, and corruption because of the fall of their father, Adam. And as a result, everyone that ever lived has to die. Do you want to go through all of that again? The 6,000-year-long war against God is drawing to a close. Once we get raptured, do you want to run the risk of having to go through all of that again? Not me. I don't want to go through Once is enough. Just like going through puberty yeah. was one, once was enough for me. I don't want to go through this whole church era, repentance, going to war against Satan, the spiritual battle and all that, and fall in human forms. Now, when I get my perfected Christ-like body, I won't get tired, I won't get discouraged, I won't be able to cry anymore, the Bible says. No more tears or pain, for the former things are passed away. Huh? Is that encouraging? Isn't that exciting, boys and girls? When you find out that the former things like death, the former things like disease, when I found out last night, you know, Muhammad Ali is dead, you know, I was like, oh man, another childhood icon, you know, the greatest here, you know, great guy, whatever. Deceived by the lies of Islam because Malcolm X tricked him, and, and the Prophet Muhammad, you know, the honorable Elijah Muhammad, promoted that agenda and because Muhammad Ali had been subjected to all types of racial injustice here in America. He 
was ripe for the picking. But even he said later in his life that he knew that the nation of Islam had manipulated him and exploited him. And when he was stripped of his title for standing up for Islam, they abandoned him. And for the three and a half years that he was without a license to become and was stripped of his world heavyweight title, guess what? The nation of Islam abandoned him. Malcolm X was assassinated by Louis Farrakhan. And, uh, did I say that? You yes. said it out loud. Oh my goodness. <laughs> goodness forbid. Look at me, you know, I'm a mad prophet speaking truth all over the internet. But anyway, after, uh, you know, Malcolm X was killed for renouncing his position that all white people were of the devil, he got assassinated. And, and then the nation of Islam abandoned Muhammad Ali until the Supreme Court of the United States reversed his conviction and restored his right to fight, and he immediately signed up the fight for the World Heavyweight Championship at Madison Square Garden against Joe Frazier in the spring of 1971. And next thing you know, he said, there was the Nation of Islam standing outside my door all over again as if nothing had ever happened. And he realized then, they exploited me, they used me. So I don't know, because I, I had heard that he had struggled throughout his life with his Christian upbringing versus what he believed uh, from a political standpoint, Islam was more appropriate for him from a political standpoint because of racial injustice in America. But he was raised in a Christian family. The parents all believed in Jesus. So I don't know which of those two things won out. And, you know, I was, uh, I was thinking when, when I, oh, Muhammad Ali's dead. You know, I don't have enough energy left to be in mourning and sadness again. You know, you know just mm -hmm. seems like the other day it was Prince. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Next thing is Muhammad Ali. You know, it's like all of your your, your icons from the past are just mysteriously and, and tragically dying. Death is a part of life in this fallen world, and you don't want when you're in the kingdom of heaven for the guy who's behind every death that ever occurred. At the end of it, Satan is really the guy responsible for it. That's why Jesus referred to him as murderer from the very beginning. What is he talking about? Murder from the beginning. But from the beginning, it's like. At the start of the, the homicide, like, like a murder trial, like the O.J. case, and from the beginning, O.J. was the murder, you know, no, he's quit. No, he's talking about in Genesis chapter 3, from the beginning, when he deceived Eve, who then seduced her husband, who betrayed God, from that point on, where every human ever born had to die, legally, because Adam was the head of the human family. And that's why Jesus referred to Satan as a murderer from the beginning, because he was the guy that set in motion the new Samirimus form of Mystery Babylon Christianity that reduced man to following his wife and exalted the woman to the leadership position. Do you guys not see that? It is so obvious when you look at Genesis chapter 3. God's not a sexist. He doesn't have it in for women and think men are awesome and women suck. No, all people suck because we're all fallen. But God has chosen the man to lead for his own purposes, and that's why he created the man in the image of God, he created women differently. That's why we look at women and we're stunned with their beauty and their physical attraction. And even the angels in heaven look down upon the woman. We're like, what on earth is that? And some of them even abandoned their first estate. They abandoned their positions in heaven so that they could come down and marry the women because they were so staggeringly, stunningly beautiful. The most alluring and enchanting creature in all the universe, a woman. No question about it, angels abandoned heaven for the opportunity to spend a few years as a husband and wife with them. And God judged them by, you know, sending the world to destroy their, their offspring with the flood. And that's why the Nephilim were destroyed in the days of Noah. But they came back after that. And they will be a part and parcel of the army of Satan during the Battle of Armageddon. This transhumanist army that has stolen the human genome, the DNA, and augmented it into supermen who will battle Jesus face to face at the Battle of Armageddon at the Plain of Jezreel when Jesus comes back a second time. So, I'm saying all that to say this, that we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that there is an apostate form of Christianity that will precede the rapture of the church and the revelation of the Antichrist. And if we are now seeing people in the church like Tom Horn promoting an apostate agenda where men are replaced with women in the pulpit, and the gospel that these women are preaching is not the gospel of repentance, salvation from hell through faith in Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross alone, but because Jesus is kind and gentle and loving, that this new gospel will be apparently more appealing, uh, this, this third wave 
of Christianity, this, this new third awakening, has a new agenda Christianity that's more palatable and acceptable by the world. So you get bigger crowds. Mm -hmm. And this gospel is different than the one once delivered to the saints, which means that we are in the last of the last days. So it's discouraging to the extent that people that aren't saved are going to get more deception. But it is super encouraging for me because I'm ready for quitting time to come. I'm ready, you know, I'm like Fred Flintstone on the cartoon at the beginning. At the beginning of the Flintstones, you know, Fred would be working on the dinosaur in, in the rock yard. And then the guy blew the horn and then the He's like, yeah, but that would do. I get to go home. And, you know, at the beginning of the show, he'd be racing out of the rock yard. Jumping in his car to get home to be with his wife and enjoy life because he knew he had to put in his work in order to enjoy his time waiting. We're putting in work now, boys and girls, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. you have an avenue, right? Because if you're a born again Christian, you're putting in work every day because you got to go into the world, and the world isn't occupied by Christians. The world isn't loving on you because you're born again follower of Jesus. The world's hating on you a little bit, so you got to be a little careful, you got to be nuanced in dealing with the pratfalls of everyday life on this earth. And it's tough. And then you gotta go out and do stuff on Saturday, like preach the gospel, or come on Thursday night, and you gotta do, you know, Bible study. Man, I'd rather be watching the NBA Finals, mm -hmm. man, than listening and talking about Jesus. But, you know, I'm part of the church, so I got an obligation. But there's gonna come a time when the work you put in is going to be rewarded. All the NBA Finals you missed, all the sleep you missed by getting up and doing things for Jesus that you didn't want to do, all the persecutions or the promotions at work that you missed out on because you were a little too vocal about your faith in Christ and they thought, oh, you know, you might not be appropriate for the sensitive leadership position because, you know, your faith. But not saying there's anything wrong, but we're passing you over. And all of that, Jesus sees and remembers, and you will be rewarded for your struggles and your sacrifice, for your labor in the Lord, the Bible says, is not in vain. And you know, it says there's coming a time when our lives will end here, whether it be through physical death, like Muhammad Ali and Prince, just in kind of through the rapture, which is what I'm hoping will be the way we get out of here. But it says, once our physical lives here on the earth is done, we're gathered to the kingdom of heaven, to the Father's house, and our works do follow. Do follow. I love that verse. You know, the martyr in the Lord. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. For they have rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Follow them what? To the kingdom, to the Father's house. All the good stuff you did for Jesus is going to follow you and be converted into an eternal reward for you. And so, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we see apostasy must come first, and then the Antichrist comes. Okay, and so, Steve, just go ahead and close it out from verse 4. It's talking about the son of perdition. Perdition is going to be revealed after the apostasy comes. Bang on down, 4 through 17. Who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he now let it, will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Stop right there. So we find out verse 9. At the coming of the Antichrist is according to the working of Satan. Satan's the one that gives him his power. And this is how you know. Because he comes with all power and signs and lying wonders. So magic tricks in the name of Christ is how you know that they're working for the Antichrist. So when Tom Horn says this new third wave, new awakening of Christianity will be a bunch of women in the pulpit who have magic powers and they can call fire down from heaven, that's not going to be proof that God is with them. It's going to be proof that they're working for the false Christ, the Antichrist. And it says, the coming of the lawless one, Antichrist, is according to the work of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonder. 
and all unrighteous what? Deception. Mm -hmm. Huh? Satan's tool to destroy mankind is deception. He didn't tell Eve the truth about what eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would ultimately result in. If she knew that every one of the kids she ever gave birth to would have to die because she ate of that tree, you think she would have still done it? No, she wasn't a wicked, monstrous, genocidal maniac. She was a kind and gentle, innocent and naive little girl in the garden and Satan tricked her. And that's exactly what we find out later in Genesis chapter 3 when God comes down in the garden says, oh, the serpent, he, he, he beguiled me and I yeah. did it. He tricked me. God said, no, you wanted to do it. You were evil. No. And that's why her punishment was relatively mild. She gets a period and it hurts when she gives birth and God's going to help her husband not bow to her dominant spirit, which has now infected her genome so that all the daughters of Eve will want to dominate and rule and control their husbands. But God's going to help them then not to be dominated over. But that was pretty much a limited punishment. She got, you know, stomach pains during childbirth in a period once a month to remind her that God was not pleased with her decision. But Adam's punishment was everybody in the universe is going to die, and it's going to be your fault, and then you're going to die, and everybody's going to hold you responsible. Every time there's a funeral, they're going to say it's Adam's fault. Not Eve's, but Adam's why? Because he was in charge. And he was the head guy in charge, so he had to take responsibility for the fall. And so we find out that Satan is coming with lying wonders and all unrighteous deception. And that's how Eve got tricked. And because she was tricked, she was able to use her power of persuasion over her husband, who was not, by the way, deceived. That's why Adam's punishment is so much more severe than Eve's. Eve was a naive little girl, and she was deceived. And that's why God doesn't want them in leadership positions. But Adam... He wasn't deceived. He did it on purpose. Why? Because he wanted to make his wife happy. He made a conscious decision to betray the God of eternity that gave him his life to mollify and coddle his wife. Oh, you know, keep the wife happy because that makes me happy. You know, you want your woman keeping you happy so you do things to make her happy because you want to get something out of it. And that's what Adam did. He wanted to get something out of his life. I like this woman that God gave. <laughs> Keep her happy. She, she wants me to eat a little bit of the fruit. You know, for God, man. I, you know, hey, I'm, you know, I sleep with this girl. You know, I, I enjoy it. Adam right? even says that you're the one who gave her to me. Yeah. yeah. So, so we, we see that, yeah, so because Adam was in charge and his sin was greater because he wasn't deceived. It was an open, knowing rebellion. That's why knowing the word of God is so key so that we can avoid deception. And so then it goes on to say, because of this, God will himself send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Why? So that they could be damned for not accepting the love of the truth, but having pleasure in unrighteousness. And that, that's got to be one of the most frightening verses in the Bible when it says that God himself is going to send the apostate Christian, the people that reject the written word of God. This isn't pleasing enough to my itching flesh. It doesn't make me feel good. I want a new gospel. God's going to send them a delusion to believe the lie that that's the truth. Why? So that he can damn you and condemn you to hell. Sounds, sounds harsh, but I like the way Dave Hunt put it. Dave Hunt said, God is giving you the power to believe the lie that you've always wanted to believe anyway. Free will. Yeah. You know, free will, it is a Pain in the butt, as it were. You know, some people phrase it a little differently, but uh, you know what I mean. And and so it is. You know, as a, a line from the movie, uh, Al Pacino played the devil in one of the movies. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of that movie? Oh, man. Was played like a lawyer. Devil's Advocate? Devil's Advocate. And he's talking to Keanu Reeves, I think it is. Yeah, and he's trying, trying to... Him. Yes, right. And he's trying to he's trying to uh, seduce him into joining up. It's like, hey, you know, I'm your father. You know, I had second like mother. You know, come join up with us. And you have all the pleasures of of, of of the world. You know, and he says, Man, but you gotta choose. I can't make you do it. Yeah. You gotta choose for yourself. All the riches and fame and wealth is the world's greatest trial attorney. You can have sex with your stunningly beautiful sister and all the women you want. Or you can go back to being just a simple small town southern lawyer and never be famous and never mention it. But you'll have your wife and you do what you want to do. And Keanu's standing there like, oh my gosh. And Al Pacino is the devil. He says, yeah, free will. It is a, you know what? But you got to decide. And, and so it is. You know, we have to choose. And we find out that 
God himself is going to send the world strong delusion at the time that the Antichrist is revealed. And I believe even beforehand, it's already begun. Because you did not love the, the word of the truth that was delivered to you, that was plain and understandable, and you rejected it, and you kept, no, this isn't good enough. I want something more, uh, you know, satisfying to the flesh. He's going to send you the power, Dave Hunt said, to believe the lie that you already want to believe, so that you can be comfortable, at least, in your rejection of Christ. Mm -hmm. Because at some point, the Holy Spirit will say, that's it. I'm not toying with you anymore. I'm not toiling with you anymore. I'm not going to force you to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ that can save you. I'm going to allow you to make your own decision about that. And if you decide to reject it, there's a point in time when the Holy Spirit says, fine, thy will be done. I'm done. And then, on the last day, when you stand before the judge of the quick and the dead, nothing you can say. Because the Holy Spirit is like, look, I, 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 I didn't have the authority to force you to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. You chose to reject it. And those people, God will send a strong delusion. So that during the 70th week of Daniel, they'll be believing the lie. And they'll be happy in believing that lie. Because they've already rejected the gospel of the truth. And people are already at that point now. People don't reject the written word of God, women can't be pastors. Tithing isn't a biblical concept for the church. People want to believe something different because they want to benefit themselves. People want to get involved in the church like they get involved in a commercial proposition and generate income. So tithing has to be part of that. Selling books about Bible prophecy has to be part of that. And if you've already written a book about the rapture, Jesus is going to come to the church, John chapter 4, you've got to keep coming up with new stuff. So guys like Tom Horn come along and say, guess what? I didn't reveal this in the other 12 books that I've published over the course of the last 15 years, but guess what? I died 20 years ago and went to heaven. God told me special secret things. Can't reveal them here, but if you get my next book that's coming out next month on my publishing company, because he owns his own publishing company and a TV station now, there's always a, a direct link between television stations, commercialized TV Christianity and apostasy seem to go hand in hand like a pancake and syrup. And so, be on the lookout for anybody that's on TV or radio that claims to be a teacher of the Word of God. You know, because I just think there's too much of a temptation to generate income. And if guys are profiting financially from the gospel of Jesus Christ, if guys are generating income, whether it be directly for themselves or for their corporation, which most churches are, incorporated, tax-exempt entities, that the head guy in charge, the CEO, the pastor, or his pastor and his wife, can generate income and not have to pay tax on Be careful of those people because Satan uses our love of money to corrupt us. And so we find out that God is going to send a strong illusion because people have rejected the basic concepts in the scriptures. In the Bible, the doctrine is clear. Where Paul says, when we can't be pastors. It's not open to debate when it says, homosexuality is an abomination. That's not open to debate. And when they had the I Am Jazz show last night, you know, you know, these people that are part of this family, you know, these are, you know, Jewish people that, you know, that, that they grew up knowing the Torah from of old. It's like your own forefathers wrote down the words that God told them to write down and included it in the Tanakh and in the Torah. And in the Torah, in the book of Leviticus, it says that if a man lie with another man the same way he does with a woman, it is an abomination to the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. Now that's very clear cut and straightforward. You either accept it as the truth or you reject it. Either it was written down wrong or God's a liar or he's a malevolent jerk who's a homophobe. Now it's your choice as to which of those options is true. But the only option that will get you eternal life is that it's the word of God is true, and regardless of what I want, this is what he wants. And since he owns the world, the universe, and all that in it is, including uh, all of us, he gets the right to tell us what to do with our lives. And we reject that for a new gospel that's more palatable to us, because I want to marry my boyfriend, because I think homosexuality is cool. And, geez, the Bible, the way it's written, the Bible, as extant, doesn't meet my needs because I want to be able to be involved in homosexuality or I want to have three wives or I want to engage in some kind of debauchery that the Bible condemns. So I reject the Bible and I create my own gospel and I put a stamp on it and I say it's in Jesus' name. God's going to allow you to do that 
but he's only going to allow you to do it for a limited period of time. And at the end of the 70th week of Daniel, all that's going to be over with. So enjoy it with Prince. Party like it's 1999, because at the end of the 70th week, the party's going to be over. And then Jesus is coming back and he's going to enforce the Bible as exactly as written in your King James Bible in English. And everybody that didn't agree with that and accepted a different new third wave, new age, women in the pulpits type gospel that was based upon a friendly Jesus that had no hell, those people will be condemned because they rejected the gospel was delivered. And so the reason why I'm being such a pain in the butt about emphasizing that tonight is that I think that we're at the last of the last days. And you guys, whether you know it or not, whether you want it to be or not, you are all soldiers in a cosmic war that has been declared by Satan in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. And it's been waging now for 6,000 years, which Dr. Henry Morris wrote uh, entitled a book after called The Long War Against God. And this 6,000 year long war against God is drawing to a close now. And we have the privilege and the honor to be fighting on the side of light and right. But in any war, there are going to be casualties. People get hurt on both sides of the line of demarcation, and people get killed in war. But the nice thing about us is that even if we fall in battle, we will be resurrected again, and we will inherit eternal life. Mm -hmm. So what can beat that? Nothing. Mm -hmm. There's the answer for you. So keep up the good work. Be on the alert for this new third wave of Christianity that emphasizes women in leadership positions, that emphasizes signs and wonders and magic powers like Minnie Hen and Catherine Coleman and these signs where laying hands on people and like, oh, you know, all of a sudden I, I can see, you know, oh, you know, now I can run the 40 in 4.3 seconds and before I could only run in 5 seconds. All of these things are part of the Second Thessalonians chapter 2, signs and wonders that Paul warned about as being the precursor to the revelation of the Antichrist and the rapture of the real church. And when the real church has gone out of the world, the only thing's left is the false church. And the false church will be headed over by the Antichrist. But before that comes will be the woman that rides the beast, the false form of Christianity, which I believe will be headed by none other than the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church system, which is already trying to syncretize Islam into its arms and syncretize apostate Protestant Christianity back into the wicked, doleful arms of Rome. And so, since we know these things in advance, it's our job to warn people and to be motivated to go out and fight even harder as we see we're late in the fourth quarter. We're probably well into the two-minute warning and at any minute the clock is going to run out and boom, and then the church is out of here. And we will be going home to the Father's house and our works will follow us. And we'll have rest from our labors. Won't you want to have left it all in the field? You know, Phil's former professional uh, soccer player in Europe. I played college football. Steve was a high school football star and now plays in leagues here in Miami. And, you know, the sports analogy is a, is a beautiful one. And, you know, the coach always say, leave it on the field. And what that means is, you know, you don't want to be sitting at home after you lost the championship game. I remember my first year in Little League football. My first year, we were undefeated. We were awesome. And we went to the championship game, and we lost it. Because uh, we, in the last quarter, we let a kid from the other side of town dominate and scored a couple of long mm -hmm. touchdowns. We lost it by just a couple of points. Next year, we redoubled our efforts. We, on defense, we were so impressed, we only allowed one team to score against us the entire year. Basically, the same group of guys came back, except our star running back and went on to, to high school or junior, on to high school, and we lost him. But our defense was so improved, we didn't allow any, only one team all year long scored us. And we ended up winning the championship, and I remember a year ago, walking off the field, crying, having lunch. It was the first time in, in sports competition that, you know, there I'm like 11, 12 year old kid, like, you know, crying. And it's the only time my dad let me cry is when we lost the championship football game and when Michigan loses to Ohio State, I was a lot of cry. Otherwise, no. we were a lot of cry, except when Michigan lost to Ohio State. And so I walked up the field that first year crying, and I remember how bad it felt. And I was like, I don't ever want to feel like this again. And then the next year we won the championship, and I just remember feeling like a million of parents took me out to dinner and all my friends, I got a trophy, and it was wonderful. And, you know, your coaches say, 
leave it on the field, man. Because if you lose, goodness forbid you lose on the last play of the game, you don't want to know in your heart, man, I was taking plays yeah. off. Yeah. If I had played 100% the whole game, we would have won by two touchdowns. We would have won by five points if I had only given 100%. So if you're going to lose and you know you lost because you didn't give your 100%, it's even far worse, isn't it? Isn't it much worse? If you left it all on the field, you could barely walk. When you walked up the field, you went straight into the stretcher and you, you were like in a hot tub in treatment for the next you know two months after the season ended. You could accept your loss a little like, hey, I, I gave 100%. There's nothing else I could have done. And I know all my teammates did as well. It just wasn't meant to be. Leave it on the field. Because when we get raptured to the father's house, I want to know. I left it all on the field. I don't want to think, man... If, if only, I, I, mean, I could have, yeah. you know, I, I got close to a thousand yards, but I never quite got beyond the threshold because I didn't really give it all. I figured next year I would get it. I'd get that thousand yard rushing season next year. And then the career ended right now, and I never got next year. Put it all out there now, and when the rapture occurs, you'll have rewards and you have more stories to talk about. You gave it your all now. It's better. You know, to give it all, you're all now and burn out early. Like, you know what? I burned out, man. I gave it all. And you know what? That's Jesus' problem. Like, you know what? I gave it all because I thought the rapture was going to happen. And I just went 120%. I don't have anything left. I got nothing left in the tank. Now it's up to the Lord through the Holy Spirit to give you the power to make it on. You got to go another five years? Then this will be it. I thought you were coming this year, so I gave it all. So who knows? But you don't want the reverse to be true. Well, I thought you were coming in five years. So I was pacing myself, and I was going to really be bringing it in 2020. Because I figured you were coming in 2021 because I read it in a book. But you came in 2016? Dang, I cheated myself out of five or six years of eternal riches and rewards that I could have gotten if I had gone out and done street evangelism, or if I had told my work for friends, or if I had you know, broken up with you know, my neighbor's wife who I was having that adultery relationship with. If I had only known you were coming now... I would have started, you know, getting serious. I thought it was 2021. I always thought, you know, there was another five or six years left. You don't want to be that guy. You want to be the guy expecting him to come this year. And then, like Stephen, I'm like, man, didn't you think he was coming? I sure did. I got a whole other year to get up again for 2016. It's better to be that guy. They have to try to come up with psychological motivation to get through another year because the Lord didn't make it back this year than to be the other guy. Mm. Who was like, ah, he ain't coming back till at least the 2020s. Yeah. So I'm going to pace myself and take it easy. And then, boom, next thing you know, he can't look old. I, well, I intended to do it. You know, I, Lord, you know, but, you know, I kind of figured like six or seven years, you know. You know, and so there you go. So leave it all, leave it all on the field. Because he could be back. And I think he will be back very shortly. Could even be this year. Because the apostasy we see coming, you know, we just had... Goodness forbid I say it, sodomite chief executive, and yeah. now we're going to have a lesbian feminist yeah. replacing him? Goodness forbid. What does that say for our country? Wickedness at the very seat of authority in our country. God's judgment has to fall, but before it does, he's got to get his children out of the way. And the only way to do that is to the rapture. Time to go, boys and girls. Girls get to go, too. So, with that... I'm done. I've said enough. So, Phil, why don't you uh, in gently and kindly in my mad tirade, you know, my prophet Ezekiel, <laughs> Jeremiah, and Elijah. Oh, Lord, once again, you were with us and you proved that your words are so deep, your inspiration are so strong that you communicate us what you want us to know what you have to bring out out there to the world. We thank you for your inspiration. We thank you for all that we've been talking about tonight because that makes us stronger, that makes us better soldier of your soldier of yours. Mm -hmm. So there is no word to glorify you. But we are here to testify how present you are and how good you are with us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, carry on. Lord willing, we'll be